Welcome. I'm uh, George Costello. I'm president and CEO of Union Station. And on behalf of our board of directors and our professional team, we'd like to say welcome. And thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule. And thank you for taking time, giving your gifts for Hanukkah, and being with us tonight. Um, it's truly special. And this is a very special evening for us. Um, First of all, I always like to tell our audience a little bit about how the journey of Auschwitz happened and then share with the community the results of the entire community embracing this story and ensuring that it was long, was not long ago, it was not far away, but it's our job to ensure that in our minds it will be very far away and it will never happen again. So when you, how many of you have had the chance to see the exhibition? Awesome, thank you. Um, and I hope it was moving and I hope it touched your heart. And more importantly, you're here now because the last comment says to do something and make a difference. And by you joining us tonight in this group, we are all doing something and we're standing up against evil. But tonight, we have an opportunity to learn from those that saw it firsthand, the children of survivors, to tell us what it's like. Can you imagine, many of you probably in the audience may have other children of survivors, but they have a unique story to tell, a firsthand story that they share. And when we open this exhibition, and by today we've had over 275,000 people purchasing tickets to join us, and we have extended it now, and it'll be here through um, March of 2020. So we're continuing to see people from nearly all 50 states uh, and several countries have come to Kansas City to learn this story and to be able to do something and say something and make a difference in our world. But when we open this exhibition, uh, now almost six months ago, we the very first people that had a chance to experience this exhibition were survivors. I am told that nearly 100 survivors are still in our community. But these individuals walked on these historic floors when they came here many years ago, probably through Union Station, almost about 70, 70 some odd years now since the, 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 the final closure. And they walked on those floors. And when we open this exhibition out front, I don't know how many of you have seen the rail car, which is provenance of 1916, which is similar to ones that would have transported individuals, their family and their children, to their murder. And we use that word very appropriately because they were murdered. They didn't perish. And it is our story to tell. But when we open this exhibition, uh, we had survivors there. And they were in front of the rail car walking on the same floors that they had walked some 70 years ago, standing right in front of the Union Station. And as Brian, you would say when they came to Kansas City, if it's good enough for Truman, by God, it's good enough for them. And there she was with her memory in front of us and uh, her spirit. We had other survivors there. But they were there as we unveiled that artifact with the first Jewish city manager standing in front of this building to say they survived and their story will not be forgotten in front of the grand lady and in front of this community. So to have almost 275,000, which I'm confident will be 300 very soon, standing with them, their memories will not be forgotten. But they were also here at the opening of the exhibition. And I was very fortunate. We will be adding artifacts to the exhibition of Kansas City in the near future. But that evening, uh, I was presented a picture by Jessica and the Midwest Center for Holocaust Education, which is our amazing partner, which is a picture of the monument. But each one of the survivors signed this for us. And that will sit and end, be at our exhibition starting in January. So they will not be forgotten, nor will any of the individuals' names on this monument be forgotten. And they will live in our stories and in your stories. So that's a little bit about what we're doing here. And um, it's a real honor to have you here during Hanukkah. We just had a, a menorah lighting in the front of the building tonight. Uh, so we're telling the story. 
and the story must continue to be told. So on behalf of our staff, we're very honored to have survivors here for what you tell and how you tell it touches our souls and ensures that we can continue to ensure that we must never forget it and that must never happen again. So ladies and gentlemen, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce to you Jessica Rockhold, see I got it right, who is the Executive Director of the Midwest Center for Holocaust Education and our dear partner. She's done out hundreds with Dr. Klein, online and in-person seminars, giving a deep, rich story. But we also announced a few weeks ago that we will make a program even greater. We will be working with the Louder Foundation and the Auschwitz Foundation in Poland. And we will be selecting high school teachers, high school teachers, correct? Yeah, high school teachers that we will be sending to Auschwitz for a deep, in-depth program. They will become the Auschwitz scholars and then they will come back and they will continue to teach the story. So the gifts, the community have come to see this exhibition. The return of the investment not only supports your organization, but now will support future children to continue to tell the story. So maybe now you'll have a teacher with you when you go all over the cities. So um, with that, please welcome Jessica Rockwell. Jessica. Thank you so much, George. Uh, the partnership that we've enjoyed with Union Station and the really meaningful relationships that we've developed with your team are just so invaluable to us and our work, and thank you. There is a quotation in this exhibition. It's on a back wall in a corner, and I've personally seen people walk by it, and I find it very profound, and I want to share it with you. It's from um, a man who is identified as a Buchenwald survivor, and he says, the experience of the annihilation of the European Jews has this tragically specific particularity that there are no survivors who can testify. There are, of course, survivors of Auschwitz, but there are no survivors of the gas chambers. No one can tell us that he was there. No one could ever, through the truthfulness of his story, make us say, it is as if I was there. All the massacres throughout history have spared survivors, direct witnesses. They were there. Hundreds of thousands of Jews of all social conditions, all ages, men and women, children and elderly people, are dead in the gas chambers, and no one can testify. We have the proofs, but not the testimonies. In humanity's collective memory, legendary or historical, fable or document, there will always be this ontological vacuum. No one could ever tell us that he has been there. We, of course, have the proof of this moment of the experience of the gas chamber, largely through the eyes of the Nazi perpetrators, they collected the evidence that we have. You've seen that in the exhibition. We also, though, have the testimonies of those who suffered the personal loss of the people who went into those chambers. There are not Holocaust survivors who were completely spared from this experience. Every survivor has a family connection to that murder in the gas chamber story. The survivors in 1945, when the war ended, were very young people. They were young adults, predominantly in the late teens, early 20s, and they had lost the generations on both sides of them. They came from every corner of Europe. They spoke every language. Their experiences were a huge range of experiences people who had experienced that very early persecution and had found a way to immigrate, people who had been ghettoized, people who had survived in hiding or found refuge on a kinder transport or in Shanghai, people who fled to the Soviet Union often to stay behind the Iron Curtain for many decades after. And there were those who experienced the camps. In 1933, when the Holocaust began, there were approximately 9 million Jews in Europe. We know that approximately 6 million of those were murdered. 
which means that we had three million experiences, three million voices that could give some kind of testimony to what their experience of the Holocaust had been. Within the Auschwitz story, where a million Jews were murdered, there were about 100,000 survivors. Tonight, we're going to hear three of those stories. In 2006, the Midwest Center for Holocaust Education began what we call our Second Generation Speakers Bureau. In that year, it predominantly fell to the children of survivors to share their parents' testimonies with school groups, public audiences, church and civic groups. They have been a critical bridge of memory and personalization. They have kept their parents' stories alive. Tonight, it is my profound privilege to introduce you to these three women who are going to share with you the experiences of their mothers, each of whom is an Auschwitz survivor. First will be Regina Court. She is the daughter of Sonia Warshawski. Second will be Alice Jack Sochtenberg, the daughter of Bronya Roslovowski. And uh, ending our evening this evening will be Matilda Rosenberg whose mother was Allegra Tevitt. Well, I feel honored uh, to be asked to speak this evening, and thank you for having me on the panel, and thank you for coming. So we're going to talk, uh, I'm going to give you a short version of what happened to my mother during the Holocaust. So my mother was born in 1925 in Poland in a small town called Mizrich on the eastern border. Uh, we're going to see some photos. This was her town uh, before the war. And uh, fortunate for us, a portion of my mother's family left Poland before the war and uh, ended up in Argentina. So we're going to see some family photos that that's the only reason that we have them. Otherwise, we wouldn't have any photos whatsoever. So uh, the photo on the right is my uncle in the circle. He was a member of a youth group. And the left is a family celebration. It was a wedding. So we see my mother in the circle. And that actually is the only photo I have of her that was taken before the war. In the back row, there's a little girl standing with pigtails. That is her sister. In this photo, we have grandparents, aunts, uncles, cousins. The only two people who survived the Holocaust were my mother and her little sister. Uh, actually, the statistic for Poland was 9 out of 10 people were murdered. And for throughout Europe, it was 2 out of 3 Jews. Uh, again, some more um, pictures of her town. And here we have my uh, grandfather, his brother. Um, this picture survived the war because it was in the shoe of my aunt, who survived with the partisans in the forest. And her image originally was uh, in between her parents, but it became rubbed out over the years, for a couple years when she was in the forest. And again, more family, aunts and uncles, extended family, and nobody in these photos survived the Holocaust. So in 1939, the beginning of World War II, life changed for my mother and her family. The German army invaded Poland and took over this reach. Then, German SS troops entered and imposed restrictions on all the Jews. They had to wear a yellow star on their arms to indicate they were Jews. They were not allowed to walk on the sidewalks or were forced to walk in the gutters. They had a curfew, and children were not allowed to attend school. All their freedoms were slowly taken away from them. The Nazis confiscated my grandfather's furrier business and my grandmother's restaurant. They forced my mother's family to leave their home and move in with my great-grandmother. And then in 1941, they were forced to move into the Misreach ghetto. Life in the ghetto was very difficult. People were forced to live in overcrowded apartments without privacy. 
There were no indoor bathrooms or running water. Food was scarce and rations were dispensed. People stood in line daily to receive a small amount of bread. People were dying of starvation and illness. As time went on, living conditions worsened as the ghetto became more and more crowded with other Jews that were transported from other towns to live in the ghetto. My mother's hometown had a train station, making it easier and more efficient to deport as many people as possible to the concentration camps. During this period of time, my mother, who was 15, and her father were forced to work at the brush workshop making brushes for the Germans. They felt lucky because as long as they were working, they would not be sent to a concentration camp. While living in their one-room apartment, my grandfather created a hiding place underneath the floorboards. When they heard the Germans rounding people up, banging on doors, yelling for everyone to come out, they quickly hid in their hiding place. However, in 1943, the yes, SS stormed her apartment building and searched the room where they were hiding. This time they came with German Shepherd dogs that sniffed them out. There were six deportations in my mother's hometown. She was placed on the fifth. After the sixth deportation, there remained approximately 150 Jews who were later rounded up and shot. The Nazis could now declare the town of Misreach free of Jews. The photos that we're going to see now were actually taken from one of the six deportations in my mother's hometown. But I can't tell you if this uh, was her deportation, but this is what it looked like. They were dragged outside and forced to kneel in the center of town. My mother's younger sister became hysterical. Somehow, my grandfather was able to grab her, and while the guard wasn't looking, he was able to escape. After thousands of people were gathered into the center of town, they were forced to march quickly to the train station, where they were placed onto cattle cars, literally packed in like sardines. This train, like all the previous trains, was on its way to the Treblinka concentration camp. Treblinka was a death camp. It had a gas chamber and a crematorium. It did not have a labor camp. When you got off the train, you were processed and sent directly to the gas chamber. On the day my mother's train arrived to Treblinka, the trains were backed up arriving faster than the camp could process the people. Because of this, my mother's train was turned around and they were sent to Maidanic death camp. By the time her train arrived in Maidanic, my mother was standing on dead bodies. When the doors of her cattle car opened, the SS were waiting for them. My mother and grandmother were selected to go to the right. If you were selected to go to the left, you were on your way to the gas chamber. They were marched to the shower where they disrobed and were given old clothes to wear. In this camp, there were no latrines, just deep holes that had been dug up. They used the human feces in these holes to fertilize the vegetable fields where they worked. My mother witnessed people thrown into, into these pits where they drowned. People were whipped, beaten, were attacked by German shepherd dogs if they didn't obey. Um, this is the chimney uh, from the, of the crematorium that's in uh, Maidana, that was in Maidana. And so you can see the smoke coming up from the dead bodies. But what's really interesting is how it shows in this photo how close it was to the town of Lublin. After four months in the camp, she and her mother went through a second selection. My mother was sent to the right, but sadly, my grandmother was sent to the left. So till the end of the uh, summer, there was another big selection 
and you had to take off your clothes completely. And this was outside the selection was taking place. When I came with my mother in front of him, he sent my mother to the left and me to the right. I don't know if you know what it means. The left was always to your dad, and the right was still maybe hoping to another camp or again, you know, to, you know, to work. So my mother was taken away from me, and they sent me on the right side, which was supposedly will go to, to Birkenau, Auschwitz-Birkenau. While this, after this selection, they took us, all the girls, where they were selected to go to uh, Birkenau, Auschwitz, to another field. And we stayed overnight, I'll never forget this in my life, in this particular big barrack. And in the morning, they made a Blocksperre. A Blocksperre meant everybody had to be inside. And they, you know, usually with a big whistle, you know, they let you know. And you had to be all inside. When this happened, we knew always something is occurring. So I want you to know that this was the, the all the women, the, what they were selected to their death to go to the guest chamber, were marching from that field where I was before. And I was uh, uh, very curious. I went, you know, to the, uh, to the big door, what we had in this particular barrack, and I could only just a little space open and to look. And this was my last, you know, vision of my mother when she walked to her death knowingly with another lady I'll never forget from my hometown too. They were kind of holding each other also, you know, in, the, in rows of five. So this was the night that I really fell apart before the next day they sent us, you know, by the trains to Birkenau, Auschwitz. So this was, I lost my mother there. Uh, this is the gas chamber where my grandmother was murdered. The next day, my mother was put on another train that took her to Auschwitz Birkenau concentration camp, where she was interned for approximately one and a half years. When she got off the train, she was sent directly to the showers. Her head and entire body was shaved. She was assigned a number number 48689 that was tattooed on her forearm with a triangle underneath it. This is an aerial view that was taken by the Americans of uh, Auschwitz and my mother saw it in Life magazine uh, many years ago. When she opened up the magazine she couldn't believe what she was seeing because it is a um, um, her, her barrack was right next to Crematoria 2 and the gas chamber. And you can see that they had built uh, train tracks, which made it uh, more efficient when they brought the people in. They were, uh, and, and the cattle cars uh, were opened up, they were right in front of the gas chambers. So it was easier to select the people and send them directly to be gassed. And this is um, a 3D model uh, of that gas chamber. And you can see where they, uh, the people were forced down and to disrobe, and then off to the right, they're placed in the gas chamber. Then approximately 30 minutes later, uh, the bodies were taken out, put on a lift, and taken up to uh, the ovens. In Ashes, her work included hard labor, carrying stones, building roads, working in the fields, and braiding fabric ropes to carry bombs onto the German warplanes. She witnessed many brutal beatings, hangings, people thrown into latrine pits to drown, truckloads of children sent to the gas chambers, people dying of typhus, malaria, dysentery, and other illnesses due to starvation and no medical attention. Every morning there were dead bodies outside of people who committed suicide by touching the electrified barbed wire fence. In 
In January of 1945, as the Russian army was approaching Auschwitz, the inmates were placed on a march to another camp. This was a death march. They were given one blanket, wooden shoes, a small portion of bread, and horse meat. They marched for several days. They used the snow for water. By the time they reached their destination at Dachau, many people had died. From there, my mother was sent to her final destination, Bergen Belsen Concentration Camp. When my mother arrived at Bergen Belsen, even after all that she had seen, she, even after she had been living in two notorious camps, she couldn't believe the human condition she was witnessing in front of her. There was death everywhere, piles and whoops. Excuse me. Piles and piles of dead bodies, people dragging bodies to the crematorium. Thousands died in this camp due, the, due to the horrific living conditions. And Bergen Belsen is where Anne Frank died of typhus just two weeks before the camp was liberated. On April 15, 1945, my mother was working in the kitchen peeling rutabagas. This was her day of liberation. However, it ended in a very different way than she was expecting. One day, when we were in, uh, uh, at work, we noticed that something is happening. We did, not, we did not see that many SS women being there in the, in the kitchen where they usually guard us, and, and a men also, SS men. So we knew something is going on and already whispers that the liberation is someplace not too far away. I was very curious and I was sitting right, you know, on a bench there with some other girls from friends where I remember. And we had, you know, I, I explained to you, it was like a barn at a very, very wide opening, like a, you know, a door. And I was very uneasy. I said, ah, oh, well, I will go out uh, to the uh, uh, latrine and you could have a, a larger, longer view because Bergen-Belsen also a very big camp. And while I was there looking out because you could hear already the, the noise from the, uh, from the earth, from the, um, that something is coming like, like uh, how, how do you call it? The, Vibration, yes. The vibration of the tanks. You could hear tanks are coming. And, and I knew this must be the, our liberation. I was so excited until, you know, coming in back to my place, you know, to this uh, in the barn. And meanwhile, where does the hungry go? The, I mentioned to you before, the men's camp was just across. They opened pride the, the, um, the doors, the gates and they all were piling to the kitchen. So while, you know, they were all piling, the guard was still guarding in front of the kitchen. And I was trying, you know, the girls were very excited and I want to, you know, already tell them too that I, I have seen, you know, the tanks are coming. And I was standing just like this and he was shooting from a very short, you know, distance and the bullet, you know, came in through here and came out through here, a centimeter from my heart, a centimeter from my lungs. And in the meanwhile, outside, the English were already there and they had all of these women, what I showed you here, you know, can I show it, you know, again? They were all standing, you know, out there on the uh, platform and, uh, and the main uh, uh, assessment who ran the uh, camp he was uh, all standing with their hands up. And I'll never forget in my life, when I got the bullet, you just don't notice, you don't know what happened to you. I just felt something like, and I noticed blood is coming out of my, I didn't even notice this place. I noticed that I have blood coming out of my mouth. I want you to know that I was drinking that blood, just thinking God, after I went through so much, in the day here in the liberation, I have to, I have to perish. In the meanwhile, one of, I'll never forget, a Russian man who came in from the camp, one of our, you know, inmates, and he picked me up and he took me to the, you know, to the window 
in the in the kitchen and he said in, in Russian to me, look out and see before you die the liberation. Uh, the medical personnel found her immediately and uh, took her to uh, the closest uh, place where it was possible for her to be taken care of and recuperate. And this is what uh, liberation looked like for some of the other inmates. The uh, uh, Bergen Belsen was so riddled with disease and typhus that they had to burn it down after they got um, all the inmates out. And uh, I don't know if you can read the, the very top one. They put a sign out front. The British put a sign out that said, 10,000 unburied dead were found here. Another 13,000 had died since. And uh, this is somebody that uh, my mother testified against. Uh, she was one of the SS guards uh, who came to the States illegally, and they found her, and my mother testified against her, and she eventually was sent back to Germany and sent to prison. And uh, so my, my father was a survivor as well, and he was a Bergen Belsen. They were liberated uh, at the same time, but they didn't know each other in the camps. But they were both in the Bergen Belsen Displaced Persons Camp, and that's where they met. And this is the Displaced Persons Camp that they were in. And uh, my family, uh, my, excuse me, my father's family, there were 10 children in his family, and four survived, so his family beat the odds of four out of 10. And here's just some more uh, photos of my mom. This, this was her uh, 85th birthday, and we just celebrated my granddaughter's bat mitzvah. My mother is 96, she's doing well, and she still goes in her tailor shop six days a week. <laughs> Thank you very much. Hi, I also want to thank all of you for being here, and Union Station and MCHE for all they've done. I'd also like to thank, before I start, my mother's two dear friends, Maureen Wilt and the late Susan Penton. The, the two of them had great patience. You know, they used to joke that they had Tuesdays with Brenya. And they, they wrote down her story, and they wrote a beautiful book. You know, my mom's children knew her story, but were never willing to get lots of details because it was too painful. So now, when I want to speak, I go back and read Susan and Maureen's work, and they did a wonderful job. I'd also like to thank Brad Austin. There'll be a slide you see that um, shows my, where all the places my mother's been. And Brad put it from PBS put it together, so it's really wonderful. And he has dates that I didn't have, so it's, I'd like to thank all of them. This is my mother, Bronya. Some of you may know her. Unfortunately, she's not alive anymore. But when I speak to kids at high schools, I always say, look at her eyes, look at her face. Can you just see that glint? You know, she had, she had spunk and moxie, and that's probably why she survived. Her story's a little different than Regina's, and I won't, go into, I won't duplicate the things she talked about in terms of the, the crematorium and other things. I'll talk about my mother's life without giving you quite as much background, because a lot of it's redundant. So this is my mother's travels during the Holocaust. As you see, she was in a lot of, a lot of places, and in her mind, the fact that she got out of Auschwitz in less than a year is probably why she survived. My mom was from a small town in Poland called Turek. Turek had a thriving Jewish population, a Jewish synagogue, um, you know, a, this, there was a cemetery, and it was kind of a nice little town. My parents didn't live in the Jewish community. They lived, and her parents didn't live in the Jewish community. They lived a little bit outside and had really good neighbors. They were, they were religious Jews, but they lived in a different place. Um, my grandfather had a warehouse and a shop he had that because he had a small business, but right before my mother was born, he won a lottery. He, he won, he won, um, it was shared with four people, it was a million zlotas, and he won 250,000 zlotas. And he used that zlotas to improve his business, and, um, and so they had a very nice life. Um, this is one of the few, we, have, we had no pictures of my mother's family at all. Unlike Regina, my mother did not have a picture of her mother. And she never got one. And as she was old, getting older, she always talked about the saddest part of her life is that she was forgetting what her mother looked like. 
My mother's in the second row on the far left, I think, but I don't know right from left. Um, and she's next to the woman with the sailor suit. She looks very serious there. I'm not sure why, because she never really was. So my, my parents, my mother was allowed to live in their house for a while, actually. Um, when the Germans came in, they came in almost immediately to their town. So it was in the, like September 3rd or 4th, they invaded. Rather than bombing their area, Everybody, all the Poles basically tore white sheets, um, put them out their windows, so there was no destruction in the town to begin with. But soon the Nazis made it clear they were, they were serious about what they were going to do. They went to the town square, and my mother saw a hanging. Everybody had to come watch. They hung the lawyers, the doctors, the architects, a Catholic priest, and the rabbis. Anyone who could uh, have any sort of resistance. So there was early intimidation to make sure you knew that they meant business. My parents were allowed to stay, my mother was allowed to stay with her parents um, and her two brothers, two sisters, grandparents, all in their house until the spring of 1940. Um, during that time, they were not allowed, they had the same kind of restrictions Regina talked about, and there was a limitation on how much food they could have, but because my um, grandfather had a lot of contacts in the non-Jewish community, they were able to get food. They were also able to bring in a tutor who would teach my, um, my mother and her siblings German as well as chemistry and math. So my mother always says the fact that she spoke a good German probably saved her life. When she was growing up, she went to two schools. She went to both the public school in Torque and then she went to something called, was the Hebrew school. And she went to the Hebrew school, which she went to five days a week. So she actually grew up knowing just how to speak Polish, German, and Yiddish, which again, and some Hebrew, which again, she believes her facility in languages really helped her. So they were in the Turek ghetto from the spring of 1940 to October 2nd, 1941. In the Turek ghetto, they were given one room and they were given that one room for her immediate family and her grandparents and one aunt and uncle. After the war, only my mother and her brother Wolf survived. In 1941, everyone in the Turek ghetto was moved to a place called Heidemuel. Heidemuel was one of the few rural um, ghettos at the time. It was, it was, they were, they were, they moved out um, Polish Catholics, my mom said, from their small huts and put all the Jews in there. They were given one lime hut for their entire family, plus they took in a couple other people who were widows or women whose husbands had gone to fight in the resistance. So they all lived in this one hut. They were given tools to farm in, in bad soil, and they were also given one cow, and that's what they were supposed to use to survive. Every once in a while they got a ration, but not very often. So during that time, my mom was there only from October 41 to December 6th of 41. In that, on that day, there was a selection. And, that, and this was a different kind of selection. This was not selection to be murdered. This was selection to have someone come work for your family. Her brother Wolf had gone off about a month earlier to go work on German um, roads and things. And they came back and they took her sister Hannah. Um, my mom describes Hannah as being this lovely, delicate woman. She'd gone to university, she'd come back, she was going to be a teacher, she'd come back, but she was weak, and she didn't really have stamina. Well, if you know my mom, she always had stamina. It was part of her carriage. So she, they took her sister, and my mom said to her parents, Hannah won't survive. Hannah won't last two weeks on work detail. I'm strong, I can do this. Her parents tried to discourage her, my mom said, no, I'm going, and she went to it was the school building, and she went to the school building, and she reported who she was and that she was going to exchange for her sister. And back then, the Germans would let them, do, let them do it. So she did. My mother often sadly says she gave her life for Hannah, but my mother survived, and Hannah did not. Hannah, probably along with her parents, died in Helmno, um, and they were gassed there. So these are the, oh, back in, this is the memorial 
in the town, uh, in, this, in the town where the ghetto was, uh, Heidelmuhl is what they called in German. They didn't, this is the Polish name for it. And Laurel has a number. It's got Byrox in it. Byrox is my mother's maiden name, and it has Keebles in it, my mother's family. So this was, these were all the people that died at this location. But before, from there, my mother went to another work camp. She went to Gorno. And fortunately, again, my mom spoke German, she spoke Polish, so she could read the signs, so she knew where she was going. Before she got there, um, the Germans took her, and they started taking people in these work details. But first, they took them to a place called Honensalza. And there, they spent two weeks beating them. And I'll, I'll, I'll read you how my mother described it. Because her words are so much better than mine. In Holzensalz, that is, it used to be German soil, too, because the Germans took it away from the Poles. The Germans occupied it. We went in, in the camp. They had whips, and they would beat you. When you walked, they would, they would beat you. When you ran, they would beat you. They tried to intimidate us, and then they took us to Gorno. I know that was the name. I don't remember what other name it was. But I saw Gorno. You memorized Gorno. Somebody told me it was Gorno, a different name. And there in Gorno, actually, it was, it was a better life. Because there, they had to build roads, they did other things, but lots of times they also got to work for farmers. Well, the farmers wanted them to be strong, so the farmers actually fed them. So they got more food, and they were able to build up a little strength. And then when she was working on the road detail, at one point, a soldier came to her and said, I, I see that you're a good worker, we need you for the harvest. So she again got to go to the harvest, and at the harvest again she got food. One of the other things they did in Grono was clean ponds. They would create ponds and they would and they would um, they would use a rake and scrape the ponds. But when they had to do it, they had to go into places where there were black leeches, and they get leeches on their feet and their legs. And my mom said that when um, you did something wrong, the Nazis would make you go in barefoot into, into the pond, not just not just um, work. My mom said they had to learn. At first, people pulled off the leeches, but they had to learn they had to wait till the leeches sucked your blood, and then they would drop off. So, but but that my mom said that was not such a bad thing, because she then she you know, she worked she at least got food she worked with detail work detail, but then one day the Germans SS came to them and said they were going to take them back to their families. Nobody believed that. Yeah, I'm going to Ashesburg now. And they took us, made us pack up what we had. They took us to Auschwitz. They took us on big trucks. And then they took us to the train station. And the train station has those, it wasn't the trains uh, where, where passengers are in. It was cattle, where the cattle are in. They put all the people, and there were, was little windows with little crate, you know, covered, very small. When they took us to the train station, and I saw they putting us in those cattle trains, I said, it is a disaster. So we went in in the train, and we didn't have any seats. We were sitting on the floor, and there were little children and old people for three days and three nights, the train went like that, back and forth, and back and forth. Little children were crying and screaming. They didn't give you nothing to eat. They didn't give you nothing to drink. People were defecating. People were vomiting. People were dying. And finally, we arrived to Auschwitz. <laughs> when we arrived to Auschwitz, there was that assessment with the big gun. And he started saying, Raus, 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 raus. That means, get out, get out, get out. And if you didn't walk this real fast, he took that gun and, and hit you. And if you didn't move faster, he took the gun and just shot you right in front of everybody's eyes. It was Horrible. <laughs> okay, we got off from the train, so there were a bunch of assessments staying and laughing and giggling with the dogs. And they would one go this way, one go this way, one go this way, one go this way. 
then pretty soon they put us in a big room and there were two SS women with the dead with the dead heads, you know. On on the head what they had. And they were holding our hand like this. One held their hand like this and one went with a needle and put on a number. And I said why are you putting a number on my hand? I didn't do nothing wrong. And she took her hand and she slapped me on both sides of my face. And she said, if you don't shut up, I'm going to put it all over your head. So when I was about 25, I read a book called Children of Survivors. And one of the things the book said was, most children of survivors don't know their parents' number. Even though they have it on their arms, they've lived their life not wanting to know it. I didn't know my mother's number at the time. After reading the book, I memorized it. When she was in Auschwitz, they worked hard. They went into uh, the forest. And my mother was in a group that actually planted trees. There were three of them. And one would dig the hole, one would carry the tree, one would put the um, dirt back in. And they worked hard with very little food, and watery, watery um, soup, sometimes a piece of bread, sometimes a tiny bit of meat in it, but usually almost no rations. And they'd go and they'd work in the forest from day to night, and they'd come back and they'd be exhausted. One day, my mother, who, as she put it, sometimes didn't think before she spoke, was in the forest, and there was a guy, I think his name was Herr Rausch, Herr Rausch, who was supervising them, saw one of her friends stop for a minute and take a break. Herr Rausch took his baby and hit her in the stomach and said, you lazy bum, my, in German. My mother then looked at him and went, and I wish I could do the quote in German, but I can't, but she said, you, you mad man, God's going to punish you. She wasn't doing anything wrong, she just took a breath. God's going to punish you. And she said she has no idea why, but he didn't do anything to her. He just walked away. Two days later, he came back, and he was on a crutch. He had broken his ankle. <laughs> when he came back, he talked to her, and he said to her, what did you do to me? And she said, I didn't do anything to you. It wasn't me. I didn't do anything. She said, he, he said, she said, you know, I don't know what God in heaven did, but I didn't do anything. Well, he talked to her for a minute, and they said, come over here, are you hungry? And my mother said, I'm always hungry. And so she followed him off, and he had half a sandwich in his back pocket. And he said to her, take it. And from then on, whenever he was working, he would bring half a sandwich. And my mother always said, do you think I ate that whole sandwich? Absolutely not. The reason all the survivors survived is because they shared, it's because they took care of each other. She shared that sandwich with the three people she worked with, every time she got one. And if there was anything left, they brought it back to the camps. And, you know, so she worked and worked, but as she put it, at some point, she became a Muslim. You know, I, I heard that term from her throughout my life, but I always thought it was some Yiddish word or something she, she made up. But when I was going through the exhibit, I saw it again here, and they talk about it. And basically, a Muslim man was basically someone who was walking skeleton and bones and was really already dead, but, but was still standing. She said that her friends tried to carry her out to the work, workstation, but she really couldn't do it anymore. And there was a selection. And she went to the selection, and she was picked. And she knew where she was going. And she got, the, she, she got on the, the, the wagon, as it all were. After a while, I became uh, also a victim to go to the crematorium in 1944. I became a Muslim, and I weighed 65 pounds. So I, I became so ill. Finally, they took me to the crematorium. They took me on a selection, and I was going to the crematorium. I was already on the truck to the crematorium. So what did I do? I say to the other girls, there were a whole bunch of young girls with me. I said, I am going to jump. I am not going to the crematorium. And I begged my girlfriends to do the same thing. 
They didn't do it. I did it. I jumped down. There were two girls who were opening the gate when you, when you uh, walked out. So the, when I saw the truck was moving out and the two assessments were sitting in the front where the radio was playing, they were drinking whiskey and singing. As soon as I saw they were singing, they are happy. I was nude, I didn't have any clothes, I didn't have anything, but I jumped down from the truck anyway. And when I jumped down, I landed on two feet, I didn't break a leg or anything. Nobody saw me. So I was hiding. I saw a ditch in the ground. I jumped in in that ditch and covered myself up with snow. And when I saw the truck was already gone, I didn't see it anymore. I ran back to the camp. I had to go back through the gate from where I went, went out. And I said to that girl who was in charge, I say, Renya, I jumped down from the crematorium. Please throw down your coat. And she threw down the coat so I wouldn't run around nude. I went back to the block from where I came from because I didn't have any other place to go. I went to that woman. Her name was Gizzy Moskovic. She was a Czechoslovakian girl. And I said to her, Gizzy, I jumped down from the truck when they were taking me to the crematorium. She said, you did. And the first thing she said, I'm not going to get a ration for you. But I tell you what, I will, I will make, give everybody a little piece of bread less, and there will be a ration for you anyway. And you will work in the camp. But I can hide you out just for three months, no longer. I said, why three months? She said, we have a roll call from the big officers who come in from Germany. And so she hit her. And she, they got her stronger, and they got her stronger, and then um, there was a roll call. And, and um, Gizzy had two sisters who were still alive, so she had to do something to survive. So she took my mother to the front of the, of the officers and said, I just found this woman. She had jumped off the truck to Cape Corman. She's hiding in my, um, my barracks, and I just want you to know. So she tells the story of a big, uh, a big, not a tall Nazi with long hands, basically hit her twice and knocked her down and then walked all over her. After he walked all over her, he said, if you had the guts to do that and if you survive this, you can live. She said she was bleeding internally, she was bleeding externally, but she went back to the block. And again, as people take care of you, that's how you survive. And she ended up going into, they, they got her a job working first um, in, in, around the uh, barracks, then into Canada. I don't know if you've read some things, but it's got another name. But Canada was where they did the sorting of the goods they took from all the people that came on the trucks. The advantage of working in Canada was there was often an apple or a piece of bread or some sort of thing in a pocket. So there was food, and you could take the food, because the Nazis didn't care if you took the food. So my mother worked in Canada for a little bit, and again, if they got the food, they would share it with everyone. And ultimately she got, oh, now I want to show you this picture. It's, I was debating on whether to show you. The woman on the far um, right is her friend Heike, who was the friend who was in the, who, who perished in the crematorium. She wouldn't jump with her. And my mom was in Israel one day and someone gave her that picture. My mom obviously is on the left. Here, but she ended up getting a job in the latrines, and the latrines was the best job for lots of reasons. Um, they were disgusting, but the Nazis didn't want to come in. And so what would happen is people would take the food they got in Canada, and somebody had, had gotten a big pot that they brought in and they found in Canada, and then they also had some, I don't know the word, it's like charcoal, it's like wooden charcoal, and they built a fire and they made soup. And so when somebody came into this latrine, for a minute, they would get a bite of soup, and they would go back out and work. So one more way of getting nourishment. Again, communal food. My mom said they only had one spoon, but everybody shared that one spoon, and what she said was, nobody got sick from the spoon. <laughs> but also, she was very fortunate. By working in the latrines, she could hear things and see things. And one day, she saw a German man 
who was not an SS officer, but he came, as she said, with a big bow tie, and he looked very successful. And she heard him talking to the um, Nazis, and they were basically bringing, bringing and selecting people to go work at his uh, factory. And the factory was making, it was in Reichbach, and they were making radio parts. Well, my mom went up to him, because she always did, she went up to him, and she said in German, Herr, such and such, you're such a, you look so successful and strong. I'm, I've never been to Germany. I'd love to see Germany. I understand it's beautiful. I'm a very hard worker, and I can translate. Um, can I go too? And he said yes. So they took 19 workers, and my mom says the sad part is all the other women who started to rush forward to ask all got shot. So they took 19 workers, and this was from November of 1944 to February of 1945. They worked um, about two miles away, two kilometers away. They lived two kilometers away from the work, and they'd have to walk through the snow because this factory was hidden in the mountains. And they'd walk in the snow every day back and forth. And as they walk back and forth, they see people sometimes who were like partisans, other things, sort of sneak over and say, stay strong, stay strong, liberation's coming. And so they did. And she worked in the factory, and she basically did inspections to make sure that the parts were good. And sometimes, you know, they would hit people if, if the parts were bad, and they'd shoot somebody every once in a while. But really, she said that the lifestyle here was good. And compared to what, you know, compared to what was happening in Auschwitz, she actually got a little bit of food. But in February of 45, as the Germans were lo losing the war, they began the death march. Just as Regina's mom um, went on death march, my mom did too. But hers was a little different. Now let me go back to Brad's first picture, because you'll see her death march. So here, they're in, I don't know, they're in, in, they're in Rheinbach over here. And from Rheinbach, they start marching, and they march back and forth down here. And they're marching and marching. And they went to all sorts of places, but there was no room for them. Because at this point, the Germans were trying to get rid of as many people as possible as fast as they could, and there was no room for new people. So they actually went to Bergen-Belsen, uh, but they wouldn't take them in. So finally, they walked back up and got on cattle cars and were taken over, all the way over to Saxony in Germany, to a place called um, uh, Valsvegel. And that's where my mom was liberated. When my mom was liberated, she was liberated by the Americans, which for her was the best possible alternative. She was liberated by the Americans. And they came and they said to her, we're liberating you before they liberate the town of Valsvegel because we understand there are mines all over where you are. And if you had stayed until past midnight, the mines were scheduled to go off and blow up the whole camp. So they cut the, they cut the lines to the mines. The Russians also showed them where the mi mines were hidden, so nobody died. When they got to the camp, and they were and then they were um, when they got to her, she was deathly ill. She couldn't take any food in. She couldn't take any food out. She couldn't drink water. But the Americans got a great um, medical care, and she got stronger and stronger. So after she was strong, the Americans said, well, you can go back to your home. You can go any place you want. And my mom said, I'm going with you. You're my mother. You're my father. You're my entire family. I don't have anything else. I'm going with you. Well, it turns out that she actually had a brother who survived. When they were, when after she went with the Americans, she ended up going to um, help at the DP camp in Lambertheim. Because she could speak both Polish and German and Yiddish, she was able to translate for, um, she, had, she said she had a Polish English dictionary and a German English dictionary, and she was able to translate for the American soldiers who spoke Yiddish or German and could translate back and forth. So her first job was to um, walk around Heidelberg and listen to what was going on in German. And the reason why they wanted to do that was American soldiers were being found dead in the water. And they wanted to hear, they wanted her to basically spy and see if she could figure out who was doing the killing. So she did that for a while, and after that she became a secretary. And she didn't, fortunately she didn't have to live in a DP camp. She was able to get, a, they gave her a room in somebody's house, and she lived there until she married my father. And in 1947 they came to the United States. And then we came to America. We came to America, to New York. The organization, the Joint Distribution Committee, picked 
picked us up. They put us in, they gave us a little room, and I was pregnant already. And the social workers, there was a social worker, and she said, you cannot stay in New York. I said, show us the map of the United States, and we will see. Whatever, whatever. we were both young. He was 20 or 21, maybe 22, something like that. Because the advantage, my mother never knew her age, and so she was younger than she really was. Uh, <laughs> anyway, we looked at the map, and we say, President Truman is from Missouri. Kansas City is the heart of America. Let's go to Kansas City. And she would always like this when she told the story. Kansas City, here I come. <laughs> this is the picture of my daughter's wedding, um, God, 15 years ago almost. And you see my mother in the center with her crowd. I and mean, this is her family. We, is, we have bad sick Holocaust jokes, I'm sorry, in my family. But this one, this one we call the Revenge Against Hitler. Because we saw, you know, look, look what she, you know, her life became. She had this big, beautiful family. And actually, since she's been gone, since this picture was taken, there are 11 new members of that family. So not only did she survive, but she prospered. And she raised, a, as she would put it, a beautiful family and was so grateful she survived. Here's my mother's number. My mother was very proud in an odd way of her number. People would say to her, why don't you have it removed? And she'd say, I can't have it removed. Because I have to remove, people might forget and we can never forget. Hi. You didn't talk about the book. Oh, yeah. OK. So you'll, you'll, you do it for me. <laughs> These are the two people that wrote the book about Branya. And Branya was so proud, I remember. She had book signings, and everybody was reading it. It was a really a wonderful thing. Do you want to say anything else? Yep, I'm done. Thank okay. you. Okay. My name is Matilda Rosenberg, and this is my mother, Allegra Tebbett. I am honored that you all came tonight and listened to our mother's stories. My mother's name in, uh, in Ladino, or Spanish, because she was Sephardic, means happy. For the years of the Holocaust, my mother did not have a happy life, but a hard life with terrible tragedies and severe hardships. My mother was a daughter, wife, mother, grandmother, great-grandmother, great cook and baker, wonderful problem solver, and a kind person. And of course, she was a Holocaust survivor. She was my hero and one of the people I look, most, look up to most in the world. I'm honored to tell you her story tonight. My mother grew up in Drama, Greece, and this area is called Macedonia. Both of my parents were Sephardic, or Jews who were forced out of Spain in 1492. The family kept the Sephardic kosher traditions alive, including all the culinary and religious customs and spoke Ladino at home. When I tell, parent, when I tell anybody that my parents were Holocaust survivors from Greece. They cannot believe it. They go, there were Jews in Greece. Yeah, there were Jews in Greece. And they reached all the way down there. Most of the Jews who lived in the Greece at the start of the war died at Auschwitz. Other Jews in the camps were, were also shocked that there were Jews in Greece, which created a, a kind of a tension between prisoners. My family, my mother grew up in, was very loving. That's why at the end of the exhibit, when they show what the families were like, that's really meaningful because many of these survivors came from happy families, two family homes, wonderful celebrations of holidays, great life until the Holocaust started. My mother and her siblings were fast learners and attended a Jewish school in drama called Alliance Francais. Um, my mother was really, really proud that she went to a Jewish school. And she'd tell anyone, she probably told half the people in this room that she went to a Jewish <laughs> school, but she was really proud of that. The students learned three languages at school, Hebrew, French, and Greek. Um, let me show you this next picture. This is the school my mother went to. On the side are three of her brothers, and I'm not sure where my mother is, but one day, my daughter and my husband and I were in the Jewish Museum in Salonika, and we saw this picture 
And it said, Drama, which is the town my mother lived in, uh, Allianz Francais School. And it had the years that she would have been a student. So the museum gave us a copy, and we took it back to Portland, where my mother was living. And we said, Mom, do you know anybody in this picture? And she started naming all the professors and the teachers, and she showed us where she was. And it was just so rewarding because that's the picture we have of my mother at her youngest. Before that, we didn't have any. We didn't know what she looked like as a baby or a young student. Let's see what's in this picture. That was my mother towards the end of her high school years. She was pretty athletic, so she must have been in some sport. But anyway, three older sisters and her three younger brothers made up the family. Her father repaired and made shoes. And it's interesting that the professions that my mother learned from her father and from her older sister are what you'll see saved my mother during the Holocaust. Those skills that she, those practical skills that she learned from her family. Um, sorry. Um, my life in drama was becoming more and more dangerous each day. My grandmother believed that the war between Bulgaria and Greece was not going to have a good ending. Um, Greece was at war and separated. There was the Italians that had occupied part of Greece, and then there was the Bulgarians that had the other part. And the Bulgarians were pretty vicious towards the Greeks. My mother's older sister, Regina, was married and had a small child in Salonika. Her husband had already passed away. She encouraged the family to come to Salonika. So the family, because of the two different occupation areas, the family had to get false papers and slowly, several persons at a time, over many days, made the trip to Salonika. On the bus, it takes like two hours, it's two hours or three hours away, but they couldn't come at the same time. The family all found odd jobs to support themselves. My mother went to work with her sister, who was a dressmaker. Two sisters uh, went to work as a hat maker and a hairdresser. My grandfather was able to get a job as a shoemaker or work you know, for extra work. And my mother took, grandmother took care of the house, obtaining food and other necessary items. Just gathering enough food for the family could probably take all day if they let you shop at those hours. My mother's brothers did whatever odd jobs they could find. With months, within months of the family leaving drama, the killing of the Jews began. They were herded into tobacco barns. That land was used as farmland, and so there was all these tobacco barns, and they put the Jews inside and burned them. Others tried to go into hiding or escape. Most of the Jews of that area were set to Theresien concentration camp. The family, that's my grandmother who had the insight to get out of. And my mother missed her so much she always would feel so bad that her mother never got to meet her grandchildren, great-grandchildren, never had a good life, you know, worked hard all her life. And she talked about that until the day she died. The family continued to find a way. And, and each day, the Nazis were putting more restrictions. Wear the yellow star. No public transportations. Times when you could shop for food and there was nothing in the stores. No walking on certain boulevards, no jobs, access to banks, and this was all done to demean and disrespect Jews. So it, it, was, a, it was awful, but not as awful as it was going to get. Every few weeks, the ghetto the Jews were forced into the ghetto. This is the Baron Hirsch ghetto. The Baron Hirsch was a wealthy family in Salonika. And they, they built these ghettos. There was a big fire in Salonica that maybe you've read about, like I, I believe it was in 1918. And these ghettos were for people that needed it. But once the, uh, the Nazis came, they used this ghetto 
that was right next to the train station as a place to cram a lot of Jewish people together. The Jews were rounded up by the Nazis with few possessions and little provisions. Many Jewish families lived together in rooms in the ghetto. By the time the Jews reached the ghetto and lived there for a few months, they believed the next step could not be worse. Maybe many of you have seen this picture, or, but this is what they, the Nazis would do to humiliate Jews. They would make them do calisthenics in the square for hours and hours and hours of time until you felt so weak you couldn't make it. And now it's a parking lot. So there's no current remembrance of what they did there. So we, uh, my husband and daughter and I went to Salonica, and this is the train station, and the ghetto's right in front. There, and you can't really see it, but there's a tiny little plaque it tells you what happened there. So they would just take the Jews and just put them on the cattle cars. The, tr the train la ride lasted over a week. There was no bathroom, just a bucket with a curtain around it. The smell was terrible. No room to sit down or lie down. Many people died on the trains. The only water was when the train would stop and the conductor would spray water on the Jews. Once your provisions ran out, there was no more food. And so you can see how far the reach was of the Nazis, because they were safe Salonica right there, right in front of the Aegean Sea, and then they're all going all the way up to Auschwitz. It's just remarkable to me how, how people could stand the odor, no food, the humiliation, Okay, this is what you see when you first get up to Auschwitz. But that's not what the prisoners saw. That's not what the Jews saw. They saw dirt. They saw fields of ash from when people were, were after people were being burned that the Nazis would bring the ash. They would see a very dark and furry place. There was no flowers or grass growing. There wasn't any. There wasn't any life. And then we, they took us to work uh, as a house commando. House commando is outside in the rain, in the snow, you know, just to break like, you know, those telephone poles, the big ones, they used to have handles and we used to push them to break the walls. So the walls was a brick, and then we take the bricks and we clean the cement out. So that's what we did almost until 1940, the end of 43. After that, I went to, we took us to Auschwitz. We used to work, from Birgina, we used to work to Auschwitz. Back and forth, we used to walk, see? And if you do something wrong, or you don't, you can walk fast, they shoot you. There was ditches on the side, and they throw them. And if they don't throw, they let you do the throwing. You know what I mean? You to pick them up, the dead person, and throw them in the ditch. So we really kind of, I was working back and forth, Birgenau and Auschwitz. And from Auschwitz, and then uh, they said they want a shoe commando. The shoes from the transport they was bringing so many people. We have to take the shoes and clean the leather separate and the salt separate to tear them up, everything, you know, and they send them to the factories in Germany. I got ahead of myself, but so I'm just going to back up just a minute because when. Um, when our family went to Auschwitz, I was really surprised at when you get off the train, how small the area is. So imagine an area like this, and you're getting off the train, and the dogs are barking, and there's German soldiers with guns, and it's chaotic, and it could be snowing, it could be raining, it could be dark outside, and there's all this confusion and fear. And you think, where's my family? 
Where am I going? What's going to happen to me? And then imagine that you don't understand the language because you're from Greece. And so you don't get the clues from everyone about having your children say they're older. And I think that would be a very frightening place to be. And so they separate the people, you know, the men on one side, the women on the other, and your family disappears really fast because you have to move really fast. So you don't know what's happened to them. And that was a really, uh, was really uh, something that stuck with my mother. So my grandmother and the older sister with the baby, Regina, they go to one side. And one of the brothers, who's only 10, goes with the grandmother. And my mother and two of her sisters go in another line to work. And my grandfather goes to the crematorium. And it just all happens so fast, you, you, you just don't know what happened. So my mother was assigned to bunk 20. And we found this bunk. We go inside the bunk, and there's no chairs to sit on. There's just those slats, I think you saw them in Regina and Alice's um, slideshow. And there's just a place to sleep. If you're lucky, you're given a blanket. If the blanket isn't stolen or taken or whatever, it's full of bugs. And so, where's the dignity? There isn't any, but anyways. Um, and in some books I read, my mother doesn't talk about it, but I think you were only allowed to go to the bathroom to two times a day, very, very rigid. If they saw you sneaking away to go to the bathroom, they would shoot you. But I could not believe how, how depressing and sad the barracks were when I went in. So anyways, my mother's assigned to this bunk. She's very curious about what's going on in the camp. She wanted to know what happened to her family, and especially her mother. So they asked for, the camp commander asked for volunteers to empty the barrel. The barrels have four handles around them. So they asked for four girls, four girls um, volunteer. One of them is my mother. So she goes into the latrines to empty it. She finds some girls that speak French, and obviously from going to the Jewish school, she knew French. So she uh, asked them, where's our mothers? Where's our family? And they say, you see those chimneys up there? That's where our parents are. And you know, my mother was probably 19, and it's hard to imagine that your parents would be burned. That was uh, something that upset her a lot over her life. And so anyways, one of the things, the other thing that the Germans did a lot was call for appel, which was a lineup. And you had to learn these words really fast. You had to learn your, your German number. You had to learn the language, really, the commands. Everyone had to stand outside in a long, for a long time, rain or shine, whatever weather. Appels could happen at any time during the day. And they were used as a way of punishing other prisoners so you would not try those same things. And no one was called by their number anymore and were yelled out by the Nazis. All this to create a climate of fear. So my mother told you about the jobs, okay. My mother's older sister died when she first arrived at the camp and my, the sister Matilda, who I'm named after, became very depressed in the concentration camp. She would not eat. My mother tried to coax her to eat with rations that she would get from going out at night and doing hair for German and Russian non-Jewish prisoners. These prisoners were allowed to get packages from their relatives in their home countries. My mother would bring my aunt a cookie or some bread that she didn't want to eat. During the first selection, sister, her sister Matilda did escape. The second selection, she was taken to the crematory. Every time my mother tells us this story, told us this story, she would cry. Uh, my mother and her sister, Julia, who's her only surviving sister, my mother and her sister saw their brothers through a fence. They were pulling a wagon full of bricks like horses. You know, they were in the front, the bricks are in the 
thing, and they're pulling them. And so the sisters asked the brothers, are they hungry? Of course they're hungry. Men were treated worse in many ways than females, especially if the men were professionals. The Nazis took pleasure in humiliating the Jewish prisoners. My mother and sister left food for three days and did not see their brothers again. After the war, she learned her brothers had died. The death marches began in 1945. The Nazis knew they were losing the war and they wanted to get rid of as much evidence as possible. They made a lot of the prisoners walk to Bergen-Belsen and um, Regina really showed how brutal it was in Bergen-Belsen. There was once a speaker here at, uh, in Kansas City that came for the Midwest Center for Holy House Education and spoke about all the different camps. And when I asked him what Bergen-Belsen was like, he started almost crying. He said it was one of the worst camps. And it was just full of disease. And there was, you even got a smaller ration than you got at Auschwitz. It was just awful. Fortunately, I think my mother was there for just six months. But on the walk, if you did not walk fast enough, you were shot. Many people died of starvation, cold, fear. The Nazis knew they were losing the war and they were ruthless. And uh, since COVID, there's been these really very interesting lectures about trauma and trauma and Holocaust survivors. And I got to thinking when I was reading about my mother on the death march, how much, you know, walking in the snow, being cold, seeing all these bodies, and how much that affected her whole life, over her whole life. And at one point, um, my mother started crying, and this German guard said, why are you crying, Kinder? You know, why are you crying, child? And she said, my whole, I'm happy, we're, I, no, she said, my brother's kaput, my mother kaput, my father kaput, my two sisters, and he said, you're going to live, I'm going to be kaput. <laughs> and, wow, that was, I thought that was pretty insightful, considering they didn't think that. Uh, okay, so. In the morning, we saw no more work, no more work. And then a week after, we went out and the girl was, was screaming and yelling and clapping and singing. I said, what happened? And we saw white flags. There was, uh, give up or should, how can I say? Surrendered. They was surrendered, the, the Germans. And we've, we saw some uh, big commander Germans and the tank and the tanks with the English soldiers and we start throwing rocks to the Germans, you know. And that was the liberation. The liberation. And some girls they never saw the liberation because they die as soon as they hear. As soon as they hear we are free, they die. A lot of girls. From starvation, from the excitement, from uh, I don't know what can I say. You know, and then they came the English and they took us to better dormitories. They give us clean clothes, they give us beds, and it's a dormitory. And then they give us food, and a lot of people they eat right away the food. And you know, when your stomach is, is so empty, and you eat the heavy food, you get sick, you die. The liberation for me, it was happy and sad. I should say for sad, because I lost everybody. And then I saw some people from Greece. I said, well, is my brothers alive? No, they took them, the crematorium. I still don't believe it. I still now. It seems to me like I'm gonna hear my brother's voice gonna say, Allegra, I'm alive. I can't believe that my brothers, I can't. I can't believe until now that my brothers are.
death is impossible. There was fighters, young boys. Um, after the liberation, my mother and our sole surviving sister, Julia, were asked where they wanted to go. Since they were not healthy and needed to be checked out medically, they were placed in like dormitories in Switzerland and Belgium. These camps were run by the Americans. The sisters wanted to go back to Greece and see if any relatives survived. Eventually, they flew to Athens on a cargo plane sitting on the floor. My mother had a cousin in Athens who found my mother and her sister on the list of survivors. The sisters stayed with the cousin for a while, slowly getting stronger, and they began their journey to Salonika. My mother and father knew each other before they were war, and they each and they saw each other. And my father invited my mother to come to drama with him. He had already been there and reclaimed his business, and so he had some income coming in. My mother and father were married um, for six months. After, were married six months after the liberation. My, brother and, oh, my older brother and sister were born in drama. After a year, few years, the family became, began the immigration process to America. The, va the family eventually settled in Portland, Oregon, and the Jewish community in Portland was a good blend of Sephardic and Ashkenazi families. I was born in Portland. Okay, my, they took the ship, it's called the USS Independence, into New York. This is the ship logger. I was able to find that at the, um, in Salt Lake City, the Mormons have a, a genealogical center. And one day we were there and I found this ship logger. There's my dad, Abram Tibet, Allegra Tibet, Sarah Tibet. But you see, everybody's name is smelled a little different. <laughs> and then, oh, so, and then there's a tracing service that's just become available in the last few years, and this gives you a list of every place that my mother went and the years that she went, and she ended up in Portland. And there's her number, 39028. So even then, they were dying to find her with her number. So my daughter and husband and I, we went back to drama. Well, I went there in 1972 with my mother, and she showed us around. And there, there was just a handful of Jews left in drama, maybe two or three. So uh, anyway, so I started asking anybody of a certain age if they were around during the war. Y you can imagine the responses I got. But anyways, I started asking people, you know, are there any Jews here? What's going on? I mean, it was hard because I don't speak Greek, but I tried my best to get my message across. And we did have a translator with us. And this is what Salonika looks like kind of now. But when I went there and, that, and um, when you see pictures of it before the war, that would have been full of ships. They called Salonika. There were so many Jews in Salonika. But now it's, it's, uh, it's still a pretty city, but it's hard to end. We went to the Jewish cemetery to try to figure out what we could do to help it. It's just all in disrepair. There's no Jews there to take care of it. They put up the statue a couple of years ago, and they immediately, or I don't know who defaced it, but my daughter and I tried to clean it up. I think the next day it was already ruined again. And that's, well, the first one's my father's number, and this is my mother's number. And I was, I was just thinking today, that it, my mother and, and all survivors are more than their number, and the people that died are more than their number. But it's interesting that I, we use this number now to trace. And, and it also, uh, just like uh, uh, Alice said, her mother said that we have to remember. I remember all my life, you know, not all the time, but like I was in the doctor's office with my mother. And this student started crying. And so my mother said to her, why are you crying? She goes, I saw the number on your arm. 
and I know what it means. And that girl had studied the Holocaust or read some books, and she just was overwhelmed with emotion. And that would happen a lot. You know, why do you have the number on your arm? So I thought that that's a message to the, to the Germans. You put the numbers on the arms, and everybody's remembering what you don't want them to remember, that there are people that survived. And, and the first picture, my dad had a gas station in Portland, Oregon. And one of his customers was a newspaper reporter for the Oregonian, and he was really taken with my mother and father's story. So he wrote this newspaper article. And it gives us, because he did this in the late 60s, and it gives us some fresher history, because my dad passed away when I was 19. So his story isn't as clear to me as my mother's, who just died a few years ago. Uh, going back to my mother's name, she always told us that she had a happy life with her parents, brothers, and sisters. My mom also would tell us she had a happy life with her children and my father. I often think of her words of wisdom. Make the best of situations. Be good to your friends. Get a good education and profession. Be kind to everyone. My mother spoke Ladino to us at home. And when she would say these sayings, they just came out so much better in Ladino. And so, um, like if my kids had friends over and they were fighting with each other, she would take the, the kids and, and, uh, and try to talk to them and get them all peaceful. And then she would say to me, see what happens when you tomo con buenos, which means take everyone with goodness. And those are words I try to live by to honor my mom. So we, we got to know Brian at Kedai, and when Matilda and I moved here in the mid, mid 1980s, her mother came to Kedai and said, I didn't want to serve Brian. I'll let Matilda tell the story. Well, we were, talk we were talking about that. And uh, Alice has a sister named Judy Jacks Berman. And I think I was talking to her because she has relatives in Portland. And we somehow made the connection. And I think, uh, just to, for brevity, that they knew each other in the camp. My mother always said that Veronica was very brave. She was short, but she was brave. And that was what she <laughs> That's what really stuck her in her memory. And it's, it's, it's amazing how, I, I think only other survivors understand really what it took to survive. And um, two things, one, when Matilda, um, when, when my mom met Matilda's mom, it was such a joy for her to meet somebody else who survived. I mean, it was like, you know, old home week in an odd way. Yeah. Um, but when Matilda talked about both her mother's um, family and Regina the same thing, I think all three of our mothers came from very happy families. And maybe that's what gave them the will to live. Um, my mother, much like your mother, always said that you have to find the good in life, you have to find the joy in life, and you can never hate, never discriminate, and never find bad in people, you have to look for good people. And my mom also said that she never hated the Germans. She hated the people that hurt her, but she didn't hate the Germans because there were good people on both sides. Now, what was the question? Was it a question? No. I didn't think it was a question. Okay, next question. <laughs> Alice, it's Kathy. Hi. Hi, Kathy. I'm a waiter here. Um, I'd like to know, as you had your own children, how you began to tell the story of their grandmother. At what point with your own families did the story become important to tell children? Kind of when? Okay, so my mother, unfortunately, was alive when my kids were young. So my kids started hearing it probably younger than my sister Judy would think was appropriate. Um, <laughs> Um, but probably at about five or six, 
you know, my mom started telling people a little bit. I have this horrible story. Again, I tell you about people's sixth sense of humor. When Rebecca, my youngest daughter, was going to the JCC camp, um, she looked up one day before she went and said, it's not the same kind of camp as Grandma went to, is it? <laughs> <laughs> so I think, Kathy, if my sister Judith the child developmentalist would, would be answering this question, um, she thinks maybe eight, nine, or 10. Um, my mom spoke to our kids' classes as they got older, um, but, she, but when she, she was, they were younger, we tried to refrain her from telling uh, strangers about her life. You know, uh, my mother in particular did not have a problem talking to us about what happened to her during the war. Um, and so I grew up with it as a very young child. And so it was so much a part of my life that when I finally had children, I felt like, of course, I wanted them to know what happened to their grandparents. And, um, but I was very careful at what age I started to expose them to it. Uh, and of course, my parents were still alive. My mother, as you know, is, is still with us. But um, they, when they were around my grandkids, excuse me, my children, uh, they weren't as intense about it as they were when we were growing up. But uh, if my kids wanted more information, they could always ask my mother or father. But I was definitely um, careful. I didn't want them, I didn't want it to be such a conscious part of their life as it was for me. Well, now that I have grandchildren, I'm struggling, and my mother's no longer alive, I'm struggling about when is the right time. So I'll probably do a lot of research and start interviewing other grandparents about the right time. I think having a parent as a Holocaust survivor carries a special responsibility for all of us. And uh, I, I we'll have to see how it all transpires, but that's the way I feel right now. Anyway, um, I find it kind of interesting that we're sitting here with masks on and because we have this transmissible virus and all the sickness that had to be going on when people were confined so closely and uh, virus spreadings that didn't unfortunately spread at all to German soldiers who were taking care of people. You know, was there any kind of, did you know of uh, remediation from the, from the soldiers to try to not catch anything that was going through the, the barracks or where the Jews were living? You know, it's interesting. Um, they weren't. They weren't so close. You know, they they didn't. Um, they delegated the dirty work to other Jews. So the people who ran the camps um, were uh, removed in a sense. They had guns. They watched, but they were really weren't. They were probably six feet away most of the time, as opposed to the um, women in my mother's block, who were other Jews who were doing some of the duties that the Nazis had assigned to them that might not have been things they wanted to do, but things they did to survive. But my mother talked about how often um, typhus would spread through the blocks. And my mother, um, when she was finally selected, most of her block was cleared out. At the same time, they were almost all selected. There were a few left because they were sick, and they were sick from each other, too. Yeah, you know, that was one reason uh, my mother survived, because she uh, had typhus before the war and survived it. So that was not an issue for her, but she did say that the, uh, the SS were terrified of typhus, and they definitely, when they knew uh, a, a particular barrack or whatever was riddled with it, they, they would definitely keep their distance. <laughs> Ladies, I would like to thank you for sharing these stories with us. We know they're very deeply personal to you. And you keeping these memories alive in our community is so precious to us. So thank you. And um, thank you. <laughs>